Well, good morning, Grace Church. Good morning. You can't imagine how good it is to be here and uh, how good it is to see you. And those of you I can't see out there, I'm glad to see you too. You know, uh, I'm glad Pastor Mark did that introduction. If you happen to be tuning in today for the first time, visiting Grace Church uh, by live stream, then you know what a wonderful, great pastor we have. I'm not him. But anyway, glad you got to see him. But I do have a word uh, burning in my heart today. <clears throat> this morning I want to speak on the subject of how to be settled in unsettling times. Or maybe I could have a little, uh, you know, secondary title, Scary Things you don't need to be afraid of. Not saying there's not some scary things out there. I'm just saying, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to be afraid. I did want to say something this morning. Uh, those of you who are, know me and are used to seeing me preach know that I'm quite passionate and energetic when I preach. I'm preaching this morning with a fractured rib. So... If I go like this, you'll know why, okay? So I don't anticipate doing that, even though I don't feel like moving around as much as usual. I do have a passion in my heart and a message. I uh, posted this on Facebook a few times that I was going to speak here, and uh, somebody else shared it, and they put, yes, tune into this. Watch Ken preach. You will not be disappointed. I cannot promise that. But I do know this. Jesus will not disappoint you. And the Word of God will not disappoint you. You know, right now we're living in a time when the world literally, the world is literally paralyzed with fear. I mean, the economy is mostly paralyzed. People are paralyzed to be around one another. People are paralyzed with fear. Uh, this pandemic has opened up a literal Pandora's box of fear and trouble and misery. It really has. But when I was a young missionary, uh, moved to the field when I was just a few months before my 22nd birthday, moved to the mission field, one of the things they taught us very, very, very early was this. You don't hide from your fears. You don't hide from your greatest fears. You face your greatest fears, and then you overcome them by faith in God. Hallelujah. Not faith in yourself, not faith in your willpower. Faith in God, you overcome even your greatest fears. Great lesson I learned as a young missionary, and I want to speak something very similar today how to overcome the greatest fears that this thing is unleashed. Certainly I can't address all of them, but I'll address just a couple. First of all, the number one fear. The fear that is behind. Now I know we have economic fears. I know we have all sorts of things going on. But the number one fear behind this entire pandemic is the fear of death. Everything we're doing with social distancing and not going places and, and not working and all those things are to keep people from dying. That's the goal. And I pray by the grace of God that it is truly working and that our efforts are saving lives that would have otherwise been lost. But the fear of death is what's behind this entire pandemic. But as a Christian, here's what I want to say this morning to you. Jesus, the hallmark of the Christian faith, is this. Jesus Christ died on a cross. What did he do after that? He went into a grave, and then three days later, he rose from the dead. Jesus Christ, the number one fear there's got to be on planet Earth is, Earth is of death. And Jesus Christ conquered death. Jesus Christ broke the power of death. 
We don't have to be afraid of that horrible fear because Jesus conquered it. He overcame it. And as a Christian, we don't have to be afraid either. You know, the author of Hebrews said it this way. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he, talking about Jesus, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Even though this is a deadly pandemic, I believe I did see the, the death toll worldwide is about 200,000 now. Even though this pandemic is deadly, the beautiful thing is the Bible says here that if you're a believer, you do not have to be held in slavery That's right. to the fear of death. Amen. Not being afraid to breathe around people. Now, I'm not talking about infecting other people. I'm talking about you don't have to be afraid to breathe. You don't have to be paralyzed with the fear of death, because Jesus has overcome it. The Apostle Paul said these words in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, death! It, you know what? You know, when you go to the dentist, you go to the dentist or some little thing, and he's getting ready to give you those shots in your gums. What do they say? Little sting? Yeah, right. Anyway. <laughs> Big sting, if you ask me. Little sting. The Apostle Paul said, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Hallelujah. Death and the grave have no sting and have no victory for the believer because Jesus Christ broke the power of death. Glory. You know what? Someday, if Jesus doesn't come soon, someday there will be a hole in the ground. And there will be a big casket vault. And if I die, they will, put, they will put my body in there and they will put me in the ground. Not a very cheery thought. Except for this, I won't be there. Amen. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. The grave has no victory because I'm not going in it. The second I breathe my last, and you too if you're a believer, the second you breathe your last breath, your spirit, you will be in the presence of Almighty God. Death and the grave have no victory over the Christian. The Apostle Paul visited heaven. He said, I visited, well, he, he was a little more uh, uh, discreet in how he said it, but he let us know he had seen heaven. And this is what he said, it's paradise. It's paradise. I'm not a, if, if, if one of you wants to send me to Hawaii, if one of you wants to give me two tickets to paradise and say, brother kid, we want to send you and Becky to paradise, I'm not going to be afraid. Give me the tickets. Let's go to paradise. But I want you to know heaven is more paradise. I'm not afraid to go to paradise. So much so that wake up every morning with the reality I have eternal life. Jesus Christ provided eternal life. Whoever would believe in him will have eternal life. So we, can, we don't have to be afraid of this big fear, the devil. So much so that the Apostle Paul said these words in Philippians 1.21. The Apostle Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What? Was that man out of his mind? To die is gain? No, Paul understood that, to, that the moment he died on planet earth, he'd be seeing Jesus face to face. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Now I want to move on to the second one. Did y'all get that one? How about those of you at home? Let me hear you say amen. Amen. Did you get that? You don't have to be afraid of death if you, if you are a Christian. Now, I'm going to move on to the second one. Um, when this all began, uh, you know, for Becky and I, I have to say it took us a little bit by surprise. Uh, usually every Friday, that's Becky's routine, 
Her middle name is Routine, Becky Routine Dornecker. My wife is very routine oriented and uh, she goes grocery shopping every Friday. Every Friday, that's her routine. I call it girl day out, but she says I shouldn't say that. It sounds like she's going for spa day. She's just going to buy groceries. But anyway, um, every Friday she goes to buy groceries. Well, you know, certainly we knew there was the virus. We knew about, you know, the coronavirus. But uh, we literally, we don't watch a whole lot of news. Uh, we watch a little bit of local news and just to get the weather. But we don't really just sit around ODing all day on cable news. So, uh, you know, we knew there was a virus. And certainly we knew that you couldn't get toilet paper. We knew that. But, um, you know, we weren't just sitting around watching a bunch of news. But anyway, that day we got up and I thought, I'm just going to go with her today. And, and we left our house on a Friday morning to go go to the bank, go to the post office, do some errands, and then go get groceries. Anyway, after we left the house is when it was declared that there was a national emergency. So we didn't even know that it happened. And all of a sudden, we show up at H-E-B, and it looked like an apocalyptic movie that day. I mean, it was like all the shelves literally were empty, no water, nothing on the paper aisle, no disinfectants, and the lines literally went from the front of the store halfway back to the back of the store, turned a corner, and went to the far ends of the store in both directions. And we were like, what is going on? <laughs> we, we didn't know there was a national emergency. It happened while we were gone that day. But I had more than one friend on Facebook at that time who put, well, come on, y'all, it's not the end of the world. And then I noticed as things lingered, more and more friends did begin to equate it with the end of the world. I had more and more friends trying to connect the dots and say, is this the end of the world? Is this, uh, you know, the end? Now that subject, the end of the world, that scares a lot of people. I get that. But you know what? It's, now, if I, were to, if I were to stand up here, this, now first of all, let me just say this. Personally, I don't think that the COVID-19 pandemic is the end of the world. I don't personally believe that from what I see in the Bible. Uh, because the earth has had many other epidemics and pandemic, temp, pandemics before. So I don't necessarily think it is the end of the world. Uh, but you know what? That subject all by itself can scare people. Just being unsettled of what's happening to our world. To me, our response to the pandemic is almost scarier than the pandemic. It really is. It's been a weird time stuck in our houses. But you know what? If I were, if I were to stand up and say, you know, a Christian, with my big old Bible, it's the end of the world! Everybody would think I was a nut. The world loves to joke about that. I've seen cartoons. I've seen, you know, TV shows where that's where they're making fun of. The, the nutball Christian saying, it's the end of the world. But you know what? Did you know that even people who don't believe in Jesus believe in the end of the world? Within the last month, a Hollywood actress tweeted that if, that if things don't go the way she wants in the election by fall, that, human, that the human race faces extinction. The world believes in the end of the world. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you're aware of it, but in 1947, a group of scholars and scientists established what they called the doomsday clock. Any of you ever heard of it? The doomsday clock? Well, of course, uh, and, and so they want to get, once a year, they reset the doomsday clock. And midnight, according to the world and its values and its, war, and its system, according to them, midnight is doomsday. And so they have adjusted the doomsday clock. And in 1947, they started the doomsday clock at seven minutes till midnight. Do y'all know that? Did you know we've been seven minutes to midnight since 1947? <laughs> According to the scholars and scientists. But of course now they are extremely, and as of January 12th of this year, 
really before the pandemic became world news, even then, January 12th, 2020, the scientists and the scholars set the doomsday clock at 100 seconds to midnight. That's the world saying that, not some nut job preacher. Uh, that's the world saying that. The world believes it's 100 seconds to midnight. Do the math. That's just over a minute and a half. So they believe because of uh, uh, atomic warfare and global warming, climate change, those factors, it's 100 seconds to midnight. And it literally is on every major news network when they reset the doomsday clock. But you know, let me just get into it this way. Do I believe this is a global wake-up call for the human race? Absolutely, I do. A friend of mine says it looks like a dress rehearsal. But you know what? When you're afraid of something, particularly as a Christian, you need to shine light on it. And so let's just look at this subject and what Jesus actually said about it in reality. Now, first of all, biblically speaking, it's not so much the idea of the end of the world as the end of the age. The end of the age is more the biblical term. Uh, and Jesus did speak about it very, very, very often. I'm going to give you a list of those scriptures if you want to get a paper and pad if you're home uh, and you want to write those down, you can. I'm going to give you a good list of them because he did speak of it really often. I'm not going to read this one, but in Luke chapter 17, Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, and as it was in the day of, day of Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And he drew attention that in both those cases, people were eating and drinking and shopping and getting married and building up until the moment that Noah entered the ark and the door shut. Did you know Noah did not shut the door to the ark? The Bible says in Genesis, I believe, 7, 14, that God shut the door to the ark. It's not like, oh, it started raining a little bit. Oh, wow, this is quite a rain. Oh, I got water up to my ankles. Hey, I got water up to my knees. Hey, we better go get in the ark. No, that's not what happened. The door shut first. And you have to think, the world around there was, because Noah had been telling them for over 100 years in preaching that this was going to happen. And the Bible says the door shut. Now I have to think at that moment, they were like, huh? Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. Why did he shut the door? And then the rain came and Jesus said, took them all away. And the same with Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. So Jesus spoke about that in Acts 17, 26 through 35. But you know, I find this, there's a lot of confusion about this subject. There's a lot of confusion about this subject because whenever... People start reading these scriptures and, uh, and Christians start talking about this subject. Invariably, they all get really fixated on the when. Now, personally, I don't think Jesus' main message was the when. Now, we all know that uh, there are you know, a good number of Christians who read the book of Daniel, and they read some headlines, they read the book of Revelation, they read some headlines, they read Daniel again, and we seem to fixate on the when. And people even argue about the when. Is it pre-trib? Is it mid-tribulation? Is it post-trib? Christians tend to fixate on that idea of exactly pinpointing when it will happen. Well, I can just tell you, give up on that. Because Jesus said we would not know the day and the hour. Now, I will say this. First of all, two things. Uh, even though he said we wouldn't know the day or the hour... In the exact same passages, he said we would know the season. He said, what, in the exact same passage where he said, Don't, you know, you, it's not, you're not going to know the day or the hour. He said, when you see leaves sprouting on the trees, you know summer is near, even at the door. And Jesus said, when you begin to see some things happening, you'll know that it's the season of his return. But I know this. I believe with all of my heart, and admittedly, I read the Bible, I read the uh, New Testament, and admittedly, the book of Revelation, not the easiest one in there to interpret. I get that. But I believe if you read the words of Jesus, 
and quit fixating on the when, what you will find is this. He gave a message in all those passages that everyone can understand. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, you know, now, first of all, let me just say this. I don't necessarily think it's wrong to be really interested in this subject uh, because I was just reading 1 Peter the other day and before Jesus came the first time, before Messiah came the first time, the Bible says that the prophets searched intently and with greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing, predicting the sufferings of Messiah. So in other words, the, Christ, the, the believers, not Christians, the believers before Jesus came the first time, the prophets were searching intently and, and with great care trying to understand the time and circumstances. It's not wrong to, to have your heart uh, at least it's on your scope. But I believe the message that Jesus gave that we can all understand is this. It's not hard. I'm going to read some scriptures. I'm not going to spend a ton of time expounding and explaining them. I believe they speak for themselves. And if you read all these passages, what Jesus said is, be ready all the time. That's not hard to understand. When you stop fixating on the when and trying to fit, be ready all the time. Live ready. Get right with God. Call upon the name of Jesus. Make sure your sins are forgiven. Walk with God. Live in a state of readiness. And then you don't have to be afraid of this big subject at the end of the book. Live in readiness. So let's just read a few of those passages from Jesus. I'm going to start out with Luke 13. I'm going to read, start in verse 22. Luke 13, 22 through 29. And then Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And he said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I don't know you or where you came from. Away from me, all you evil doers. Therefore, there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. And when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrown out. People will come from the east and the west, the north and the south, and will take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. So Jesus is telling us here that there will be a time when people, first of all, notice this. The question they poised him, are, are only a few people going to be saved? He didn't even answer that. He didn't say, oh, there'll be five or there'll be a hundred thousand or there'll be, you know, a million or a billion. He didn't answer that. He said, you make every effort to enter the narrow door. Narrow door, what's that? Jesus. Amen. Enter the narrow door. That's what, that was his emphasis. Why do you want to stand around here debating and arguing for, for 12 hours about when it's going to happen? Just get right with him right now. <laughs> Give your heart to Jesus now. And then you don't have to worry about the door slamming shut. But Jesus indicated that's exactly what would happen. And he, it says that... Uh, and once the, it says that they'll want to enter, but they won't be able to. Oh, what's that mean? People can't get saved if they want to? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. What it, but it's the very next verse explains it. Once the owner of the house gets up and shuts the door. In other words, then it will be too late. Hey, I thought you said this was supposed to comfort us. It will. Stick with me. The real point Jesus made is that the door to the kingdom of God would unexpectedly like a th would sh shut like a thief in the night. The door of the kingdom will be shut and locked. Now I realize that's kind of jarring, but let me just give you a few passages 
If you want to write them down, or I'm sure this message will be archived. Uh, Matthew 24, 43, Luke 12, 39, Luke 17, 26 to 35, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, 2 Peter 3, 10, Revelation 3, 3, Revelation 16, 15. All those passages say the door will shut. That will be the end of the age. You say, well, that's not very comforting. That's scary. It's not scary if you're right with Jesus. It's not scary if your sins are forgiven. It's not scary for the door to shut if you're inside with Jesus. And that was Jesus' message. That was his message. We'll read another passage here, Mark 13, uh, 32 through 37. Mark 13, 32. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. That's the message of Jesus. Be alert. Watch. Be ready for his coming. I have to say every day I go out of my backyard, I try to start my day out there praying. Man, I know where the eastern sky is. And I look up to the eastern sky. Yay! Jesus is going to come back someday. I'm I'm not scared about it. I'm looking forward to it. It's exciting to me. And if you're a believer, you don't have to be afraid of this subject of the end of the age. You know, I have to say... Back in the 90s in particular, a lot of churches really began to take on more, uh, instead of a biblical identity, the church took on kind of a corporate identity. You know what I'm talking about? We want to look like a corporation. And it all became very corporate and business-like. And I understand that um, certainly they were trying to maybe make it to where more people would come in by being more sensitive to how people felt when they come to church. I get that. Not saying anybody mo- anybody's motive was impure. But I think little by little, the church at that time really lost its message because we tried to look all corporate, dignified, instead of sticking to the Bible's message. And it became anemic. It became an an anemic message, like, hey, I like chocolate ice cream. Well, I like strawberry ice cream. So what? It doesn't matter. That decision has no consequence. But the decision on whether or not you need to become a believer and receive his forgiveness and mercy is a choice with the ultimate consequence. And the church, a lot of the church became very corporate and became afraid to talk about that message. We became just another self-help message to improve your life. It wasn't that much different in a church message than than an afternoon talk show message. Hey, this is good for your life. And you know what? If you become a follower of Jesus, it will improve your life. But there's a whole lot more to the Bible's message. And that is, God wants to save your eternal soul. He wants to save your eternal soul. There's more at stake than just this life now. There's eternity. And God loves you. And he does care about that. And I, for one, am an evangelist. And I feel a passion to tell the world, you need to cross the line. In the, Bible, in the Bible, I hear, I hear a certain number of celebrities, even during this coronavirus, and they, they, they are talking a little about, about God, but they won't cross the line and believe in Jesus and the Word of God. It's just like where Paul said, where the king, listening to Paul preach, and he said, I almost am persuaded. Well, I'd want to, I want people to realize, almost will not be good enough. 
Fall on your knees and call upon the name of Jesus and ask him to save you and forgive you for your sin. It's not a joke. It's for real. But the message became very blurred then. You know, Jesus said that part of the gospel was to tell them in Matthew, uh, Matthew 28, he said, tell them everything I have commanded you. And so this idea of the door shutting is part of what Jesus commanded. Now I want to switch gears. You know, and, and I, uh, I just want to say this. The United States at least went through a very traumatic time in, two, in 2001 with 9-11 when the terrorists uh, hijacked airliners and crashed them into buildings and killed 3,000 people. Very traumatic time. I don't know if you remember, some of you are too young, but there was actually also at that time people sending uh, something through the mail that would, anthrax through the mail that would kill people. I remember I was downtown uh, New York City preaching after 9-11 and there were mailboxes were turned over and pushed into the streets because people were afraid of the mailbox because people were mailing anthrax right at that same time. And you know what? Tons and tons of people flocked into churches at that time. But you know what? I've seen news story after news story. About six months later, they all came in and they all just left. In other words, they didn't hear a message while they were there that gave them a new heart and a new life. They didn't understand the consequence of following God. They came in, they heard, ah, then they left. Let us not make that mistake this time. Let us be perfectly clear that it matters. You know, I, I'm sensitive to my pastor. I love my pastor, and I know he has a difficult job to do. I know that because uh, I was a pastor for three years, and I certainly don't want to speak a message that unsettles the sheep. But at the same time, uh, sometime during this seeker sensitive, sometime we got so seeker sensitive, we didn't even want to unsettle lost people. That's a mistake. Right. If, you, if you don't know for sure that you're right with God, oh, come on, it's not a joke. You need to get right with God today. Now I'm going to speak one more parable from Jesus in this section before I move on. Uh, to me, it's one of the most riveting and amazing passages Jesus spoke on. So before I get, it's, it's found in Matthew 25, but before I go there, I give you a little bit of background. To, it's a little bit helpful to understand the Jewish wedding tradition. And in the Jewish wedding tradition, the young man <clears throat> settled on a young woman. He picked out a girl, and if she agreed to marry him, and then the two families felt like it was a blessed union from God, and it was all settled, they didn't, send, they didn't just send out a save-the-date card. You know the card I mean? Send out the save-the-date. June 1st, 2 p.m. At this church, there will be a wedding. That's not how the, the Jews did it in the first century. What happened is the young man settled on the girl. She agreed. The families called it blessed, and they called it a union. But then the young man disappeared. He went away, and he began to build a house. He began to build a place for them to live. He began to build a place for them to start their new life. And it wasn't a save the date thing. He didn't say, I'll be back on June 12th. He didn't know when he would get done with the house. And he would be gone building the house, working on the house. Maybe it was far away in another city or another village. And the bride waited. And the wedding party waited. And the bridesmaids had their dresses. But they just waited for the bridegroom to come back. Now when the bridegroom finished the house, the, he, he, he finished the house, he had a place for them to live, a place for them to start their life. Only when he finished the house, then and only then, did he come back for the bride and for the wedding. And people didn't know when it was. And so Jesus spoke a parable about that in Matthew 25. It's called the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Now you have to understand, when he got done with that house, he was ready to get married. He didn't necessarily come back at 7 a.m. or 2 p.m. He might come back at midnight. He might come back in the middle of the night. In other words, it would be dark out. And so to get, when the, bride came, when the bridegroom came and the wedding feast was going to start, he just came back. And nobody knew exactly when that was going to happen. And so they needed a flashlight. They needed a flashlight to get from their houses to the wedding venue where they were going to have the great feast that, that was the true wedding feast. 
And so they needed a flashlight. Okay, in Bible days, they didn't have flashlights. They had lamps with oil in them. And so Jesus talked about these ten bridesmaids getting ready for the wedding. But five of them were wise. They had plenty of oil in their lamps, and they were waiting for him to come. Five of them, they didn't have enough oil. They couldn't keep the, light, the lamp burning. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 6 of Matthew 25. At midnight, they were rousted by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. And all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. And then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough oil for all of us. And they said, Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. And while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. And then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. I'm going to repeat that verse again. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Verse 11, later when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch. For you do not know the day or the hour of my return. You know, I'm not even going to take any time to expound on that particular parable. I think we all understand it. It's hard to not understand it. Jesus said, those who are ready at the end of the age. Now, I realize, of course... Uh, that these days you don't hear messages like this very often. Maybe when you hear this idea that the door to the kingdom of God will shut and lock, that, I understand that's jarring. We're not used to that today. You're not going to hear that on the TV preachers. And your response might be, no, oh, that's horrible. Oh, that's just harsh. Oh, that's just mean. No, listen to me. Listen to me. First of all, let me say this. I remember looking forward to my wedding feast with my wife. I remember we were so excited. We were giddy. We couldn't wait for it to happen. And the bridesmaids who were ready, they got to go have a wedding. Are you afraid to go have a great wedding feast? No, it's fun. You get free food. You see people. The wedding feast is not scary if you're ready. It's something to look forward to. But for the five who weren't ready, it is, it is scary. Let's just be honest about it. It is. But it's harsh. It's mean to say that the door of the kingdom will shut. No, let me tell you why. A couple of reasons. First of all, you know, when, a, when a, a young mother is standing in the kitchen cooking and her little four-year-old toddler's all over her feet, you know, and the mother says, no, 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 don't touch the pans up here. Don't pull one of the pans off on you. They're hot. Does that mean? No, it's beautiful, it's gracious, it's glorious, it's loving. She loves her, to- her child, she wants to protect him. Warnings are not mean. Warnings are beautiful. Thank you, God, for warnings. It's not harsh that Jesus warned us. Now, here's the best part. Folks, when Jesus spoke that parable, I want to tell you what, this would have been harsh. This would have been harsh. If Jesus would have come and said, the door to the kingdom of God is shut. Now that would have been harsh. But he didn't say that. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the door. Folks, the door to the kingdom of God has been open for 2,000 years. And for 2,000 years, God has been calling out to the human race. He's been calling out to every generation faithfully. I'm a missionary. I get on airplanes. I go places. I go th- I live my life to be an ambassador for the kingdom. And my message is, come to Jesus Christ. The door is open. That's not harsh. The door is open right now for you. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. If you're visiting our live feed today for the first time and you're a little unsure of all this stuff, I'm telling you, the door to the kingdom is open right now for you. 
You can become a believer today. At the end of this message, we're going to pray together. Jesus said this in Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Father is so excited to invite people into the kingdom. He wants you to come in. I'm going to close with a couple of illustrations today that tell us how wide the door is open and how bad God wants you to come into the kingdom. First of all, realize God sent his son to die on a cross. He loved you more than his own life. That's how bad God wants you to come into the kingdom. I heard a story years ago, and it's actually a true story. It's based on a, a real uh, event. I'm not going to say the name, but a very famous mayor who was a municipal judge at the time during the Depression. And uh, I'm not going to tell you his name because I'm changing a little bit of the, I'm changing the monetary values to kind of update them from what it would have been in the Depression to, so we get what it meant. But um, he was a municipal judge and he was in night court and it was the Great Depression and things were very tough and there were a lot of poor people. And some guy committed a crime and he was just poor and he was sick and tired of being poor and he was sick and tired of not being able to take, to his, take care of his family the way he wanted and in just frustration he smashed a, a window of a shop downtown and he stole an object and he went and sold it just so he'd have some money. Oh, I finally have some money to, to take care of my family better. And, but he got caught right away. And this young man wound up standing in the night court before this famous judge. And he was standing there and he was literally trembling. He wasn't a career criminal, but he had made a mistake. He'd made a horrible thing. He'd committed a crime. And he stood before this judge trembling and pleading for mercy. And the judge stood, of course, behind his great <clears throat> lectern with his black robes on and his books of law in front of him. And he looked at the young man and he said, you have committed the crime. There's no doubt about that. And the shop owner will not, he wants to press charges. I have no, I have to charge you. And I have to punish you because the law doesn't give me discretion. This is the crime and this is the punishment the law says. You committed this crime. And so, It'll be a $1,000 fine or 30 days in jail. A $1,000 fine or 30 days in jail. And the young man really began to tremble and plead, I don't have $1,000. Judge, if I, go to, if I go to jail for a month, I'll lose my job. I'll lose everything, please. The judge says, I'm sorry, but the law doesn't allow me to do anything different. Guilty thousand dollar fine or 30 days in jail it's your choice but then the judge did something amazing he was the judge he pronounced the sentence but then he took off his robe he took off his robe and he came down from his great lectern to the floor of the courtroom to where the defendant was seated and reached into his own pocket and with his own checkbook he wrote out a thousand dollar check not as the judge just as a compassionate a human. He wrote the check out for $1,000 and gave it to the young man, just as a compassionate man. Then he went back up and put his robe on again and became the judge and said, what is it going to be? $1,000 or 30 days in jail? And the young man said, I'll pay, the, I'll pay the fine, sir. You're free to go. You're free to go. The fine has been paid. Folks, that is the essence of the gospel. Jesus Christ became the visible image of the invisible God. And the Bible says he came down to earth and he took off his heavenly robes and he paid the price to open the door to the kingdom of God to everyone. The door to the kingdom is open right now for everyone. Come in. Come into the kingdom. The fine has been paid. The door is open. It's the Father's good pleasure. Prodigals come home. People who haven't been in church in years come home. Those of you who are not sure your sins are forgiven, come home. The door to the kingdom is open right now to you. Give you one more quick illustration as I'm closing. 
you know, I've done this probably before in this church, but I just love this one. You know, I'm holding in my hand a Bible and most Bibles in English are more than a thousand pages long. A lot of information there. Sometimes a little hard to get our mind around it all. But you know what? I turn and I put my finger. We got Genesis 1. God created everything, including mankind. But I put my finger in Genesis 3. So the first couple chapters are about God creating everything. And in most Bibles, it's two measly pages. It's two measly pages of us walking with God the way we were supposed to as human beings. Two pages before we blew it. But in Genesis chapter 3, we disobeyed God. And we did what we weren't supposed to do, and we sinned. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That far into the Bible. But I got news for you today. The message I stand up and preach to you today and the message I stand up and preach all over the world is this. It's called the message of reconciliation with God. I'm telling you the, this much of the Bible, this much of the Bible, the rest of the Bible from Genesis 3 all the way forward, this much of the Bible is God saying to humanity, God saying to you as an individual, I want you back. I want you back. I want you in my kingdom. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's a great message, folks. The message of reconciliation of God. I'm going to close with one last little verse, a couple of verses. And um, they're found in Luke chapter 14. It's another parable of Jesus. And it's another parable about a wedding banquet. And uh, there were a lot of people and they were making a bunch of excuses. It was time for the wedding banquet and the owner said, I've got the feast, I've got the food, I've got the venue, everything's here, come. But it says the people made a bunch of excuses. They did, oh, I can't come. Oh, I gotta go to work. Oh, I gotta go sell a donkey. Oh, I gotta do, they didn't come to this great elaborate feast. But hear the Father's heart as I close with these few verses. And the servant returned and he told the master what they had said. And his master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and alleyways of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, There is still more room. So his master said, Go into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that my house will be full. God wants his house full. He said, go out to the country lanes, the highways, the hedges, and compel people to come in. Here in the Bible, he said, the country lanes, and here we do it today by live stream. Compel people to come into the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Jesus said, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. You need a new heart. You need a new heart. You need a new life if you've never been saved. It means to turn. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. So turn from your sin and turn to God. Now, I don't necessarily believe it all starts with like some magic words. Just mumble this prayer and you'll get it. It's not really what it's about. It's about being reconciled with God. It's what it's about. However, the Bible does say it can start with a prayer. Romans chapter 10, it says you believe in your heart that God, you, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart God raised him from the dead and whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you are not right with God, you're not sure these uncertain, unsettled times have scared you. You're not sure if your sins are forgiven and you're right with God. Why don't you pray right now with me? Um, Let's just say a prayer. I'm going to ask those here in the, the, the worship team and everybody here gathered to say the prayer after me so that maybe somebody out there will hear and at least know a little bit of how to get started. Just say a simple prayer. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. So say something like this. Oh God, I want to come into your kingdom. I will turn from my sin. I turn to you. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And he rose from the dead. 
I call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Forgive me for my sins. Save me. Give me a new heart. Give me a new life. I come back to you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, guys.